Hello everybody, can you hear me okay? I don't know, Shorty's machine's making a lot of noise back there. So uh, I got a few minutes to kill because, well, Shorty's machine sucks, because it doesn't suck. So it's literally gonna take me like 45 minutes to pump all this water over because I forgot to switch his pipes over like I was supposed to last night, my bad. So what am I gonna do today? Well, I forgot I need to get back to the historical. Because one of the things I've always really liked is the Civil War. Big surprise. So today, I'd like to talk about the Butcher, Grant. And why, well, he wasn't really the Butcher. It's kind of an interesting topic, because if you know anything about the Civil War, you know that on the Eastern Front, uh, none of the generals ever really could get a foothold in Virginia and keep it for any amount of time. Uh, you had a lot of incompetent generals. Uh, for some reason, the ones in the East, they tended to be more politically motivated generals. There were uh, political generals instead of um, picked out of the merits of their military career, like the ones in the West, like Grant, he came up from the West. Which, of course, during the Civil War, Tennessee and Missouri, that was the West. Um, so a little background on what made Lee so great and other than the generals just being inept, uh, one of the things that made them inept was because Lee was such a great military mind anyway. Uh, he really was the best. And even today, his tactics and strategy, strategy more than tactics, but it, it still taught in military academies, and not even just in the United States. Um, him and Stonewall Jackson, um, a lot of their stuff is still taught as what to do when you have an inferior army facing a superior force. And that's really what it came down to with Lee. He, um, he was always outnumbered. There was never a point where he wasn't. Uh, well, he, was always, he would always split his force. So if you're already outnumbered two to one, you split your force, then each part of that force is now like outnumbered three or four to one instead of just two to one. But with that maneuverability would bring a surprise, the element of surprise, of course. Uh, nobody would expect him to split his army because McClellan had 120,000 men and Lee only had 60. So what do you do? Well, he splits his force and he leaves 30,000 men to fight here. And the other 30,000 men go somewhere, nobody knows where, and then in the thick of the battle with everybody fighting, well, boom, there they go, there's those other 30,000 men. And I don't really care how big your force is. If you got 120,000 men, they're all fighting this way against these 30,000. If you have 30,000 more coming from behind you or the side of you that you didn't even know were there, it's gonna freak you the hell out and you're gonna retreat and you're gonna lose the battle. And that's what happened time and time again up until Grant. And Grant had success in the West because he knew how to pin down a foe. Uh, as far as uh, getting forts and cities to surrender without even um, assaulting the towns, Grant was the best because he knew he could pin you down, he knew he could starve you out. So why do they call him the Butcher? Well, once he took over in the East, the war took on a whole new level of carnage. The casualties for the last two years of the war were significantly higher on both sides uh, than they were prior. Because Grant knew he was gonna have to use blunt force. He was gonna have to use his army to do what armies do and to do what nobody else wanted to do. Nobody wanted to sacrifice their army. Uh, McClellan never wanted to sacrifice his army. He was great at leading it. He was great at organizing it. And it was a lot of things were thanks to him that it was as, or, as organized as it was, but he couldn't use it. He would develop this grand strategy and the first time there was any uh, variation, he couldn't adapt. And especially in the face of people like Lee and Jackson, he didn't know what to do. And he would retreat, even when he outnumbered two to one, he would retreat thinking he already lost the battle. So when Grant came along, he knew, this was right after Gettysburg, he knew how to win battles, he knew how to win. And he wasn't in charge of the army that McClellan was, well, not directly. McClellan was in charge of the Army of the Potomac. Grant, when he came over, he was in charge of all the armies of the Union. 
So he had to coordinate north, south, east, and west. He was the supreme commander, reported only to the president, Lincoln. So Meade was still in place, because they weren't gonna they weren't gonna replace Meade. Uh, he had just won the battle of Gettysburg, and the, the thing that's really great about Meade winning the battle of Gettysburg was he only made command a few days, and he already developed the strategy of how he was gonna win once the South actually invaded Pennsylvania, and he had to deviate from it. It didn't go as planned, but he was able to come up with um, a very viable defense and force the Confederates to attack them, which is what the Confederates always did to the Union. So they weren't going to replace me. He never did anything wrong. He was still technically in charge of the Army of the Potomac, but Grant decided he was going to travel with the Army of the Potomac, which effectively put Grant in charge of that army, uh, and he really circumvented Meade a lot when he shouldn't have. Uh, but what, do you, I mean, what are you going to do? Who are you going to complain to? <laughs> so Meade was kind of useless at this point. The grand strategy was mostly what Grant decided. So what did he decide? Well, he knew he had to pin down Lee. He had to pin down General Lee. General Lee's greatest strength was when he had mobility. And the only way to take that away was to take it completely off the table. And really the only way to do that was to get closer and closer to Richmond. Because the closer and closer you get to Richmond, the less maneuvering room you had. And it all started in the Battle of the Wilderness, which is May 30th, around that, uh, wait, or was it April 30th? End of April, yeah. Wilderness Battle was the end of April, 1864. And that was a terrible battle. Wilderness, thick forest, thickets everywhere, um, trees catching on fire, the forest fires. You got all these wounded soldiers, but the death toll was so much higher because these wounded soldiers were just burning to death. Um, just not good. This was really the first battle that would give Grant the name of Butcher because he was he was attacking through this. He was actually trying to get through down these three roads through this portion of Virginia to get closer to Richmond, and it actually made it pretty far before um, I think it was uh, the cavalry found him first and were able to slow him down long enough for the Confederate army to coalesce and uh, create a defense. So he kept attacking anyways. He, he gathered his army in that place and he attacked even though he knew this wasn't good ground. It wasn't good ground at all. It was a terrible place to fight for both sides really. Um, and those casualties were huge. Huge. And at the end of it all I know I read, I read this excerpt from the book, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't, I don't have it right in front of me, but it was basically the soldiers saying um, after the Battle of the Wilderness, which the, the North technically lost, the Confederates stayed on the field ready for another attack through the burning trees. And when it came down to it, Grant was retreating. Well, they all thought he was retreating. And nobody knew which way he was going to turn. Was he going to turn left and head back towards Washington like every other general had done up to that point? Or was he going to continue on down the road? And by continuing on down the road, getting himself closer to Richmond and signaling that, yeah, I'm here to fight. Well, he went down the road. He went straight down that road. And the men cheered him. They cheered the butcher. Of course, they didn't know he was the butcher yet. But they know they just went through this terrible battle and they weren't getting a break and he was marching on to another battle and they cheered him because they knew that finally there was somebody in charge that was going to use the army the way it was supposed to be used. So, within a week, they were already fighting another major, major pitched battle. This one lasted for days and days on end. They were in this place uh, at least 12 days. I think longer. It might have been longer. It might have been more like 20. Hold on, I'm checking some water levels and that pump still really sucks. It's barely going down. Ah, look at all that nasty water. Anyways, 
So this was the Battle of Spotsylvania. And once again, the Confederates, they kind of outflanked Grant. Well, they did not flank him, but they had the interior line and Grant had farther to march. So the Confederates got behind these works before Grant could get there. So they were already pretty well dug in. Um, they had entrenchments all over the place. Um, the worst place being what they would call the mule shoe sounding, which was actually shaped like a mule shoe, or uh, horseshoe, you know, um, and it came to an angle that kind of stuck out, um, kind of like a bubble sticking out from the rest of the earthworks. And this is really where the worst of the fighting happened. Grant just kept throwing his army. He started facing um, east, and by the end of the battle, he was facing west. Because he just came all the way around and just tried to fight and fight and fight and fight and try and outflank him and ended up on the complete other side of the earthworks. Uh, but the mule shoe salient, which ended up being called the Bloody Angle at Spotsylvania, was probably some of the worst fighting they'd ever seen. 23 hours straight of hand to hand and close quarters combat. In the driving rain, pouring rain the whole time, it was terrible. Uh, the mud was so thick that soldiers were stepping on top of other soldiers that had already fallen and, and, and just swishing them down into the mud. And I know it sounds, it sounds really gross. I mean, I'm sure it was terrible. Uh, literally just burying them in the mud where they laid. Some of them might not even have been dead yet. They might have just been injured, too injured to move. And uh, I know one part I read about these horses that were hooked up to uh, some cannon and they were trying to get up really close to the salient uh, on the Union side. They were trying to get up close to blast the Confederate earthworks with some cannons. And the horses were dead, but they were so thick in the mud, they were standing up. They couldn't fall down. They were just standing up, and it looked like they were alive, just waiting for orders. But they were really, they were dead. They couldn't fall. Just sitting there. Standing there, not sitting there. But uh, well, this is the kind of terrible stuff Grant had to do. But he knew he had to keep Lee pinned. He had to. If you could keep Lee pinned, it took away that element of surprise. It took away that maneuvering capability. And there was really no clear winner at Spotsylvania. But Grant didn't break through, so technically that left the Confederates in charge of the battlefield again when Grant left. But what did he do? He moved farther south. Farther south. Then came the Battle of Cold Harbor where he tried to turn towards Richmond and uh, the Confederates met him again and had a staunch defense again and another pitched battle again. Now we're talking somewhere in June. So now we're end of April, all through May was basically Spotsylvania. They were there for, I think, 20 days. And then right after that into Cold Harbor and uh, just another staunch defense by the Confederates. I don't know how they did it. You gotta remember at this time, the Confederates, they, they didn't have the manpower. Um, all the research shows that by this point in the war, every time the army would stop, they were throwing up earthworks. Like they wouldn't even wait for the commands anymore. As soon as they as soon as they got to where they were going for the night, the first thing they would, they would do is start building earthworks. They were done with this fighting in the open thing. It just, it wasn't gonna happen anymore. Uh, and that kind of played into the Confederates' hands because they needed the protection. They couldn't stand in the battle anymore. There was less and less of them every day that they couldn't replace. Grant, for all intents and purposes, had infinite resources as far as manpower goes. The Confederates, they were running out. And Grant knew that too. And that's what he had to do. Uh, his, his march from the wilderness to Spotsylvania to Cold Harbor was bringing him ever closer to Richmond, just kind of spiraling in on it. And uh, finally he was just able to pin Lee down in Petersburg and Richmond. It was, it was kind of, uh, they were close enough together that it was basically one big siege line for both, for both cities. Uh, and it started there on the southeast corner of Petersburg and just kind of went from there. But that's it. And, and that's, that's what Grant knew he had to do. And that's why he did it. And that's why he's gotten the name of the Butcher because the, the casualty rates once he took command were much, much higher. But it's, it's not like he didn't have a strategy. It's not like he didn't have a tactical mind. He was a, he was a, a tactical genius in his own way. Um, he could look at a map and know exactly how long it was gonna take, how many men to get down one road a certain a certain way, and, and what they needed to get there. He 
he had it all figured out in his head. He was a mathematician. He could figure it all out by looking at it and be pretty damn accurate uh, about how long it would take to move forces along a road and uh, given whatever conditions. So, uh, the butcher? I mean, not really. More like doing what you had to do. Uh, you had to pin Lee down. You had to defeat the Confederate Army. It was the only way the war was going to end. You could even capture Richmond, which they did in the end, uh, but the Confederate Army was still left. So what does that do for you if the Army's still there? Fortunately, by that point, the Confederate Army was basically wasted, and they were pretty easy to capture. Uh, more than half of them didn't even have weapons. So, so he's got the nomenclature as the butcher, uh, and it's a little unfair, and a lot of that comes from, um, from the southern sympathizers of today. Uh, they like to point out that he was the butcher because he couldn't have possibly beat General Lee. And uh, the only way he did was by throwing away men. Well, he didn't throw them away. Well, he did what he had to do. And uh, what he had to do was pin Lee down, take away that maneuverability, and just hammer the crap out of his forces. That takes men. That takes manpower. Especially with the evolving of the battles being the way it was and, and being uh, the next closest thing to trench warfare. Which is really what started the trench warfare that you saw in World War One. Really, kind of started during the Civil War, especially towards the end, like 1864. And uh, so, yeah, that's it. That's Grant. That's the butcher, and that's what that's what he was up against. And he ultimately he prevailed. And that's history. Don't know what else to say about it. Not a butcher. The guy was a strategic genius. He was the commander they needed at the time, because that's what had to happen. So uh, y'all have a good one. I'll holler at you later.